It is my pleasure to introduce to you to Cat Sweet. Is that good? Can you hear me? Okay. Still good? Maybe there. All right. Level ears were not made for things that don't have collars. <laughs> so good morning. Um, I will warn you in advance. I have a cold, and so I'm feeling a little, uh, a little drained. Um, but I'm sure some of you were out late last night. So hopefully, between the two of us, we form like one competent human. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Ming. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Kat Sweet. I'm an information security analyst at Duo Security. I've been there for about a year. Um, I will not be answering any probing questions about Cisco's intent to inquire, to, to acquire Duo. Um, <clears throat> so, I, uh, a big part of my job is security education internally for employees at Duo. Uh, and uh, this is often a topic that people think uh, either it is an exercise in futility. The prevailing wisdom seems to be kind of that security education is a binary. It can either exist as effective yet inefficient training for a really small population <clears throat> or efficient yet ineffective training for a large population, automate all the things. And so I want to talk about, I guess, success stories of sort of delivering more in-depth than the basics, uh, role-based security education that helps us um, scale up effective training, <clears throat> sort of champagne security add on a lemonade budget, which I'm guessing a lot of us have. Um, so not just going for efficiency, but actually going for something that's going to be effective for change. But I also want to make sure I give us a chance to, I don't know, hold space and talk about, talk about security education in general, and I'm happy to answer questions. We have a mic here, and we're a pretty small crowd, so I want to try and make this somewhat interactive, and um, <clears throat> if I have uh, lost my voice, I will keep going. I've got water, the best water $6 can buy on the strip, <laughs> and um, I'm happy to take questions at any point and at the end about security education, about how we've done it, about how I see it outside of work, um, so yeah. Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you are responsible for um, various uh, security education things at work? Oh wow, a lot of you. Cool. How many of you feel that you have enough resources to do that effectively? <laughs> so for those in the front, that was like four hands. Um, yeah. So um, we're recorded, so I'll repeat back shout outs, but what are some of the problems you are trying to solve in, in your internal security education? Yeah. Engagement. Engagement. Usability. Usability. Retention. Retention, yes. Oh my god, how do they remember what they just got thrown at them like one minute later? Compliance. Compliance, yes. Security education <clears throat> is a compliance requirement for a lot of people. Mm. Yes. Generating interest, yeah. How do you get them to actually be engaged in a thing that they have to go to? Yeah. Maintaining that across a huge site, basically problems of scale of a huge company. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And some of the challenges come down to having enough resources for that. Um, <clears throat> so every year, SANS does this study um, on, uh, basically, they put out a report on the state of security awareness. And the, um, oh, sorry, Mike. The biggest challenges are time resources. Um, to devote to security education, awareness, and outreach, they're consistently lacking. <clears throat> Another problem is that training is often really generic. And so there's that problem of how do you get people engaged? It's not contextual to employees' roles, particularly when the training is outsourced. When it's not homegrown, you're thinking like, okay, how does this actually, what does this have to do with me and my company and my role when it's just this canned message about, yeah, don't click shit? Um, scaling is often addressed, I mean, don't click shit, but sometimes you have to click shit. Sometimes it's your job to click shit. <laughs> And scaling is often addressed via over-automation. Um, when, when 
this more in-depth, tailored, contextual, role-based training beyond the basics does exist. A really common split is to group employees into just a few buckets, upper management, technical teams, and everyone else, and sometimes just technical teams and everyone else. So regardless of where the lines are drawn, each team oftentimes just ends up re receiving training separately. And the everyone else bucket is a big bucket. So this can lead to some further scaling challenges. Um, developing curricula specific to each role or each team and each, or each level of sensitive information that people deal with can a lot of time and uh, resources. Sorry. Is that better? Cool. Um, so sometimes important focus areas. Um, yeah, this needs to keep going in and out. So one second. I'm wondering if I'm bumping anything. All right. If anyone is hacking packets, don't hack these packets. Actually, I don't think this is a very smart mic. <laughs> um, what's that? Please know to be hacking this packet. <laughs> um, so anyway, so important focus areas get overlooked. Um, for example, technical teams might focus on just uh, the OWASP top 10 training, really application security specific. Um, I think maybe the back is dying in this. Um, but nothing about threat modeling or basic OPSEC. Um, can we maybe get an AV person? Thank you so much. I'm, yeah, sorry about that. I apparently didn't make a sacrifice to the demo gods this morning. Um, cool. So, okay, so there's a lot of challenges out in the security education landscape, so how do we address them? Where do we start? We have to think about what problem are we trying to solve? My manager always tries to map everything that we do back to what problem are we trying to solve? So we are trying to enable the business. We're trying to protect our company so that the company can succeed. And so we need to think about what are, the, what are our assets? What is the information we deal with? What is the most risk? What is the highest risk? Um, and so who are the people who deal with the information that is the most sensitive, that would have the most detrimental impact if it were to get um, made unavailable or compromised or leaked. And start with those high risk roles. Um, we can also think about pooling multiple groups together. <laughs> A mix of technical and t teams across all seniority levels. We don't necessarily need to break upper management away. Um, pool them together. Out if they're dealing with different information. Oh, thanks, Grant. Um, how do we? Get... Sorry. <laughs> um, how do we build off concepts and training that all employees receive and uh, go deeper together while still thinking about our own individual roles and access? So we also um, a few people mentioned things like engagement, interaction, retention, and so we really need to be thinking about. How do, we break, how do we bring in interaction and collaboration, um, especially if we're distributed across different um, spaces? Somebody mentioned um, being in different offices. So we need to think about how, how can we build something that engages remote employees? How can we do something where people who aren't just in a physical space can be engaged? Because oftentimes, re remote employees or employees who aren't in a centralized location are more likely to just have the security education automated away. It'll be like, just watch this video, don't come into the classroom. Um, so I'm going to be talking mainly about like one specific uh, example uh, of training that I built at Duo, but using that as a way to think about the larger problems of scaling security education, about making sure we're building stuff that's actually retained and that, has, that opens the door to continue um, to build security engagement when we're not just all sitting in a room together once or twice a year. Um, and so I encourage all of you to also think about like how, how you can maybe take one example, two examples, and build out, um, build out similar things. Um, <clears throat> cool. It sounds like the mic is doing its thing now. Knock on wood. 
So, <clears throat> I was doing a lot of the other kind of hacking last night. <laughs> So I mentioned um, identifying these high-risk teams. So if you have to choo choose um, where to focus your educational efforts, um, you can start with people who are in the highest, highest impact targets based on their role, based on their access, based on the sensitivity of the information they handle. Basically, what is, their, what is the attack surface of the entire company and who's the most likely uh, targets for, um, for disruption to all of that. So I'm going to throw it out to all of you who in your company, not specific names, but specific teams or specific types of roles, who do you think are, the, are some very high risk targets? Finance. Finance, why? Because they are uh, often asked to wire money to unknown resources. Because they're often asked to wire money to unknown resources, yes. Uh, I saw other hands. Executive assistants, yes, they are the gatekeepers to upper management and they get all the things, their points of intake for the most high profile people in the company. Um, sales and marketing, why? Because they're easy targets. Because they're easy targets. <laughs> can you elaborate on that? Because correctly crafted, anyone can be an easy target for social engineering. Yeah, they have a high volume of emails and especially sales, they're interfacing heavily with external people. Whereas like my role in corporate security, almost everything I do is with people within the company. So yeah, you can hand up as well. Uh, professors. Professors. Oh, so you're with a public university. Public or with a uni with sorry, with a university. Yeah, yeah. why professors? Yeah, you've touched on something a lot of people have in common, which is they just want to do their jobs and not have security be a thing that gets in the way. Um, blue shirt, then glasses. What's that? I'm sorry? Customer service. Yeah, oh man, it's really easy to call somebody in support. Yeah, customer, give me a, here, give me my own accounts. Oh man, it's happening again. Uh, let's see, your hand IT support. IT support, same thing. They, yeah. Yeah. Data analysts, why? Yeah, they have access to all the data you do. Yeah, so pretty much you can map it to anything. So it depends on what, basically, what's your threat model for, for your business. Um, so high profile employees like upper management. And you have to think about like two, what is it, going back to the, the old CIA triad, um, teams with a significant impact on confidentiality um, of data like legal, significant impact on um, availability, like, like DevOps people. Um, you have to think about physical access too, like facilities people who are um, the first line of defense when you enter a physical building. Recruiting, people who are going out and meeting strangers and getting, um, getting resumes from strangers. So it's their job to download strange attachments. So identifying these teams also gives the security team more deliberate visibility into the rest of the organization. It makes you actually think, okay, what are, the, what are our assets? What teams do have access to these assets? Basically just like extensions of risk, risk assessments. Um, so security teams um, identify who the high risk teams are, what kind of access each team requires, and more about each team's attack surface. 
One that I didn't hear called out was security teams. We are also super high impact. We know all kinds of things. We drink and we know things. Some of us don't drink and we know things. Um, but we have access to things like vulnerability scans. We know about all of the incidents that happen when there's IRs. Um, so we too are not completely, um, are not exempt. Um, and in the case of my, like, certain employers, one could argue that, like, certain, just by being a certain type of company, you, your employees are all high-risk targets of one way or another. So rather than telling attendees of a training why they're there, I did we can do exactly what I did with you and um, have them tell us why they think they're there. Start, starting with that mental exercise sort of sets the tone of people um, getting into a mindset of thinking about their attack surface and really evaluating what they, what the impact is um, to the company, to the business, of what, based on what they have access to. And this type of discussion also promotes a better understanding of the, the big picture, the attack surface of other teams, instead of just like, I'm on the security team, I know that I have access to information about incident response and um, vulnerability scans and stuff like that, but maybe I need to start thinking about the big picture of why I might be also concerned about like what the finance team has, like vulnerability to phishing attacks related to tax season and stuff like that. Um, so it gives people a bigger, a clearer sense of what we're all, what, why we're all in this together. Um, and that's good to keep in perspective too. Um, it's easy to get siloed, especially when you start to get to be a bigger company. Um, participants also know more about their respective roles than the security team presenters do. Like, I think a lot of us in the community maybe like to think we know everything and know what's best for everyone, but we do have a lot to learn from other teams. And we, it's, especially as we get bigger, it's harder for us to have visibility into what everyone is working on. And so having trainings like this in the first place gives us as security team members more insight into other teams' roles and access uh, and increases increasing visibility into our whole security landscape into our whole environment enables us to do our jobs more effectively. Because as they say, you can't secure what you don't know. And also, letting participants across many teams or departments describe their roles or information they handle takes the burden off the security team having to front load, prepare all of that information ourselves going into giving trainings. Um, this also just helps build trust. Um, we spend a lot of time telling people what to do and not enough time listening to people. And so we have a lot to learn from other teams and I think it builds trust when we go in there and say, tell me about what you do instead of just having us lecture them. And presenters can engage in this discussion too. Um, like I mentioned, security teams um, are very high impact and so Letting participants know that we're not exempt from all of this, from all of this important stuff, um, makes it feel more peer-based and less top-down. And I think that's important because oftentimes that's better for feeling engaged when it's a peer talking to us and um, teaching us things than um, somebody just lecturing us, you will do this, you will do this, this is why you should be scared, you're cool. So, when we identify what we are trying to protect um, and who we're trying to protect it from, basically just go down the line of threat modeling. When we teach security awareness, we often tell participants, think like a hacker, and then kind of leave it at that. We really put them through the actual exercise of getting into an attacker mindset. Um, although when I teach lock picking, that's exactly what we're going for, and people love picking locks. Um, so. I like giving participants a chance to threat model what they're trying to protect um, by devising scenarios where they hack each other based on their own roles. Um, I called it hack your neighbor. Um, just pair them or group them instead of having everyone work on their own and then they go through this mental exercise of what would an attacker do and leverage my role to do harm to my company. So again, they get better insight to um, other teams' roles and access if they're, working, if they're thinking about someone on the same team. I'm so sorry for the mic issues. Um, and people with outsider knowledge may come up with really creative methods of attack if you have people trying to hack each other. Um, everything from like 
say you've got a recruiter and somebody tries to get information out of them by like going up to them at a recruiting event asking all of these questions. Oh, who reports to this? Who's this manager? And then escalating levels of sensitive information. So and it's in recruiters jobs just to be very helpful and accommodating and give out information. Just one example of many. Um, also, the sort of interactive um, threat modeling and, atta and devising attack scenarios together, again, um, interaction is more, way more effective than lectures, and um, if you can tie these scenarios back to real life examples, if there's any that you can share from that have actually happened, people are really interested in what has actually happened and know that what they can come up with isn't actually that far-fetched. So then how do you bring it all together? Once you've got all of this on the table about like, okay, we're boned, uh, <laughs> everything is terrible, how do you actually bring that back to you don't have to be scared, here's what you can actually do? So regardless of differences in teams' roles or their technical skill levels um, and the information that they handle, there can be a lot of common ground in the way we talk about proactive security advice, um, especially for roles that are higher risk beyond just the basics of don't click shit and use 2FA, use strong and unique passwords, use password managers. So one really common universal theme is just basic OPSEC. That's something that a lot of people going in don't think about or they don't necessarily map their personal to their work stuff. And so they don't necessarily think about information that they're putting out there just either on social media or just by using their computer in a coffee shop without a privacy screen. Um, <clears throat> so, and they, they usually don't think about others' information that they're, that they're giving out too. Um, so it's important to think about not only their own, protecting their own asses, but also thinking about others' roles and how they map that back. Um, really good example that I use is, um, I gave a security training at our all, um, all hands kickoff meeting earlier this year and um, our CEO then tweeted out a photo um, the next day and covered up some laptop screens on it and didn't say and didn't do it during the training and waited till afterwards and didn't say the location and I'm like yay OPSEC from the top down. Um, so we also want to encourage open lines of communication. That's a pretty universal thing regardless of which team people are on. Um, that as members of the security team, we want to make ourselves available. And so that's something that we constantly need to be reinforcing and living. Um, so we go beyond just like tell people, report fishes to, to the security team. Um, we really want to encourage that they can consult with us, that they can partner with us. And hopefully, they're going to be more receptive to it after we lead with listening instead of lecturing. So where do we take all of that? So we can use security trainings as a jumping off point for identifying additional, um, additional needs for education and additional needs for awareness and opportunities for partnerships between security and other teams. Um, areas where we need to improve our messaging. Every, every training that we give, um, whether it's somebody's um, specific, somebody's roles or just a, um, a general all-purpose um, annual security training, it's an opportunity for iteration. And so that's something that we always need to be keeping in mind, identifying feedback. Um, measure efficacy, not just compliance, not just checking the box to make sure everyone has gone. Think about what kind of impact is this actually having? What problem are we trying to solve with this? And what are the next problems that we're going to solve? Keep the doors open for, future, for not only future trainings and educational opportunities, but also for open communication between the security team and other teams um, in between when we're all in a room together. Um, iterate on training content based on feedback and also based on shifting business needs. This is a thing that's going to become super relevant um, in my case as we go um, from a company of 700 to um, being part of a company of 70,000. Um, you can automate the absolute baseline of security messaging, but as you go higher on the pyramid of training, 
instead of what tends to happen is things get more automated. As you tailor efforts and as you go beyond the basics, you really want to get less automated as much as you can for as long as you can. Um, there's really no substitute for interaction. There's no substitute for engagement. And you can take that and run with it. Um, so we have a lot of time left. So um, the mic does work. And so if you have any questions, um, please feel free to use the mic. And I'll be happy to answer them. Oh, see one? So especially at large companies, um, or when you I'm are- I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing. <laughs> if you can speak up. So especially at large companies, um, or when you are a trainer for hire, essentially, mm -hmm. carving up your audience into roles beyond everybody, the technical, and maybe the executive admins, do you have any suggestions for helping people brainstorm, or- For how people can what? For how people can brainstorm, or uh, how you can get like that group together, because uh, 2,000 general users can't all be in the same auditorium at the same time. So, oh sure. Suggestions in that space. Um, I would say one thing to do is even if people can't be in the same physical space, if you have um, any kind of capacity for remote collaboration, whether it's like Zoom or WebEx or something like that, get people on a screen together, even if they can't be on a room together, um, just so they still have that synchronous training, um, or that's it, that they that they can be in the same like in the same discussion even if they're not in the same physical space. Um, it, that also, um, if they're in a bunch of different locations and they're not just like distributed remote, another thing to do is start thinking about how, to, how you leverage and build security advocates in other departments, people who can be champions for you when you can't be there yourself. Find somebody in sales who can talk security with other salespeople. Find somebody in marketing who can talk marketing, uh, um, security for marketing people, things like that. Because um, we can't necessarily be everywhere at once. So it's when we, we got to think about fostering um, our, our champions to be our eyes and ears. So yeah, good question. When you're speaking to a department that isn't your own. Sorry. Uh, sorry, is that better? A little. Okay. I think you need to really hug the mic. Really close. Better? Good. Okay. When you're speaking to a department that isn't your own, how do you best put the bottom rung on the ladder, figure out where they are, and then figure out where to build from? Okay. Um, asking is a good start. Um, you can also, before you're actually in a room with them, try to, try to sit down with someone, engage where they are, um, just try and figure out what they, what they need um, and where they're at from a technical level. Sometimes it helps to think, like, ask like, what they're working on, and that way you might know like, what, what, kind of thing they're what kind of things they're dealing with. But yeah, never hurts to ask. Cool. Hi. When it comes to building and maintaining community engagement, what works and what doesn't work with gamification, awards, certificates? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that. What works and what doesn't work in terms of gamification, awards, certificates? Free food. <laughs> Completely serious. Uh, um, yeah, I think people. I think people generally like gamification. Um, the problem is it can turn um, it can turn into a lot of uh, work for um, for somebody to build build that in. Um, but yeah. Um, Rewards. I would say just normalizing recognition on a day-to-day -day basis to always uh, instead of just uh, having a few big ones. Um, because if you have like a security friend award once a year, it's e it's easy for people to forget about that. So if you've got levels of um, of uh, giving recognition, giving um, giving um, good karma, basically, um, Slack even has a karma bot that you can give. Um, just ways of like building, building it into the culture instead of just, um, just having um, small things. But also, yeah, free food if you are at a company that has a culture of free food or a budget for it. <laughs> so first of all, thank you. Despite the uh, mic issues, I think you did a really great, a really great talk for everybody. Thank you. Um, what about cadence and frequency? Oh, yeah. 
Um, so from a compliance standpoint, usually the minimum requirement is to give security awareness training once a year um, for certain frameworks. Um, but I would say um, it, it depends is the, is the short answer. And I guess it depends on the size of your organization and the time resources you have and also um, what, the need, what the needs are. Um, but I don't think it's out of the question to have something security related um, a lot more frequently than once a year so that people don't forget it. Um, whether, it's, um, whether it's something kind of um, tailored for certain people like a, like a secure coding workshop or something else, just keep, something that keeps it top of mind. And um, yeah, anything from like a monthly lunch and learn or something like that, um, definitely more than once a year, probably more than once a quarter. Just something to get people there. <clears throat> cool. Um, anyone else? We've still we're still doing okay on time. And if you have a question you'd prefer to not ask in the audience, I will be around for a little while afterward. Um, I'm also I'm the sweet cat on Twitter, so feel free to come and find me that way. Um, I will try not to cough on anyone. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, we got one more. False cadences. All right. Hi. Hi. What are your thoughts on the perception that security is a function of IT? That security is a function of IT? Yeah, we run into that a lot where um, the general perception is that security is a, uh, a part of IT and therefore it's an IT related function and sometimes it's hard to get people uh, to realize the import. Okay. Yeah, so hard to get people to realize the importance of security as a function of IT. So. If you're running into that issue, um, I don't know, why, what, why is IT important? Start there. Because <laughs> um, we, there, people probably wouldn't be able to do their jobs without, without internal tech support. Um, but I think emphasizing that security is kind of a function of everything in one way or another is important too. Um, that, it's, um, that it's not this walled off thing. It touches every, asset, every aspect of the company. So um, yeah. But um, yeah, I guess decoupling it from IT isn't, um, it can be a thing, but also you can also use that to, and here's why security is important it, it, as it relates to IT. So yeah, hi. So in a, in a perfect world, like we're all passionate and interested in doing this, right? But a lot of times, especially in like, smaller organizations with like a large user base and it sounds weird but like RIT is like seven people oh sure so um, and like 30,000 users so um, we have issues like internally generating interest in like the people who kind of fell into the security team at all so like my problem is getting people to just want to like fucking do it yeah you know? <laughs> it's like you have the same job as me but you're not interested in like talking to users or like getting any of this information out there? Generating you... interest a among security yeah, people. Yeah, internally. Yeah. Seems like a dumb question, but it's a big problem. No, it is, it is. A lot of people think that um, any kind of user education is an exercise in futility. And so that's a huge, uh, a huge roadblock that we're up against. So I think it's important to remember that users don't have to be just the weakest link in the chain. Like they, have the potential to be our greatest asset. And it's in our best interest to be engaging with them for many reasons. One, oh, hell. <laughs> um, for one thing, if they trust us, they're going to be more likely to report stuff to us, and they're not going to be scared to report things that could be detrimental to our company. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, in thinking about the way we interact with users and making sure we make ourselves available. It's also in our best interest to know, um, like I said, what's in our environment and what people are doing. So there's a, there's a visibility argument to be had. And then um, there's just the uh, making sure that we're, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, I will be chugging cough drops after this. Yeah, so there's the visibility argument. There's just making ourselves not antagonistic. Um, and then, yeah, we need to, um, yeah, things like that. Um, basically, I think we need, 
we need to not think about users as the enemy. And so if we can think about um, security education as a security control, and that's one that's important to implement, then hopefully security people will not, I don't want to say stop, because there will always be people that don't want to do education, but think about it as um, an important security control for our team. Yeah. Hi. Um, I work for a managed service provider, so we have a lot of clients on oh, yeah. the smaller side, and in many cases, you know, you have high value folks like uh, doctors, lawyers, executive types who demand lax security for themselves, and then tighter employee, uh, security for lower value targets. And, and I just, I've never really been very successful in inspiring these folks. I wondered if you had any thoughts, like screen lockouts even. For oh example. man. I'm, I have mixed feelings on screen lockups. I think um, it can be funny to determine somebody's screen upside down if they don't lock it, but it also might make them shamed. And I don't think shaming is necessarily a, um, a good, we want to think about carrots, not sticks. So I think you've got to um, find a way to bring it back to what they value and put it in those terms. Like when I talk about password managers, a lot of it comes not back to like because security, but because productivity, because it's, it's efficiency, it's hundreds of passwords that you no longer have to remember and it frees up brain space. So you don't always have to put security in security terms. You have to sort of meet them on their terms sometimes. So think about what they value, how you can work with that. Yeah. All right, I have some question. Uh, this is uh, when it comes to a, a large company wherein you have a lot of uh, users. Mm -hmm. So uh, we already frequently send like a security awareness. So can you speak into the mic a little oh, more? Uh, Thank you. We actually have like a large base uh, user in our company. So uh, we frequently. Uh, send them like a security awareness and uh, as part of the security team we still receive a lot of uh, alerts from them so uh, since we're already giving up uh, like a security awareness what would be your uh, best approach so so we can have them uh, so we can instill it to them and um, I mean uh, make it more efficient because we're already giving them the awareness but still they're missing it out so what is the best way that we can implement it without forcing it to them, like uh, providing like memos just, to, just mm -hmm. for them to stop. And also, uh, yeah. what's the best way on how we can measure it as well, the, measure the effectiveness of the security awareness? Yeah, um, so to address the first question of how can we um, make sure we're actually um, doing our training effectively when, when, you're, um, when you're giving security awareness and alerts are still, first of all, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's inherently a bad thing that alerts are still firing because if you suddenly have no alerts in your sock, something has gone horribly wrong. <laughs> um, but there, um, there is no 100% secure and there's no 100% uh, informed user base. So I think, um, I think one of the most important things is making sure that you have a positive relationship with other, with other teams that they feel safe to report things when something has gone wrong and that they feel safe saying, yes, I clicked what, tended, what ended up being a phishing link um, so that they can admit it because the more information you have, the more quickly you can remediate a situation. And if you're doing something where a user isn't going to feel safe, then that, I think, in my opinion, has a higher potential for uh, risk to the company. Um, and so as far as um, thinking about effectiveness um, of that, yeah, uh, so I think a lot of times security awareness trainings only tend to get measured for effectiveness in terms of clicks on, a, on an internal phishing link like before and after or over a monthly period. And I think sometimes that can actually kind of lead to like phishing fatigue. They're like, oh yeah, I got another one. Let me just, let me just not click this anymore. Um, so I think some other ways to think about measuring success, um, and this is something that I'm admittedly not in, um, I, I'm, I still, metrics aren't like my specialty, but we want to think about other ways we can track, um, track engagement, like how many people reported a f an internal phishing campaign uh, before and after. Um, track engagement just in general with how many people are interacting with a security team. Track 
how quickly people update their devices when an update, um, if, you're not doing automa if you're not automatically pushing out updates. Um, how many people are using a password map? How many people have two-factor authentication enabled? Um, what is the attendance like when you give security trainings and security education events that aren't mandatory? Or if you've got like a CTF going for Hacktober, how many people play it? Um, also, metrics don't just have to be numbers. Numbers often lie. And narrative is data too. So think about qualitative feedback as well and what people are saying um, about your security education content and take it from there. That's often where you get the juicy stuff. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question was, uh, is there any security uh, tra training resources that you would recommend? Oh yeah, so one that I really like is the EFF Security Education Companion and their Surveillance Self-Defense Guide. Uh, they have really good basic guides in there for things like uh, how to threat model, how to protect yourself on social media, how to set up two-factor authentication, and then the Security Education Companion is also, they've got a bunch of different um, pre-made training modules as well as some train the trainers stuff, so I definitely check them out. Oh yeah, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF, their Security Education Companion. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, I was just wondering. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. I was just wondering, has your approach changed now that so many companies are 100% in the cloud, where like everyone's very empowered to spin up virtual machines and they may not understand private subnets versus public subnets and security groups and things like that? Um, since everyone's so empowered now, I was wondering if some of your education is towards that at all? Or? Um, I think that actually makes a piece of it easier because you don't necessarily have to talk about VPNs in a Beyond Corp environment. You can say the network doesn't matter because your device is trusted. Um, so uh, it's not necessarily harder, just different, I would say. All right, any others? Sold. Thanks for coming.